Welcome back for our second installment of chapter one. Um, this is section two. We're going to be talking about chemistry and the applications that it has in the world. In this section, some of our basic objectives is to make it so that you can identify some areas of research affected by chemistry, also describe some examples of research in chemistry, and distinguish between macroscopic and microscopic views. And that's actually where we're going to start today. Macroscopic and microscopic share the word scop as the root word, and that means to look at in Greek. They differ in their prefixes. Macro is from the Greek M-A-K-R meaning large, and micro is from M-I-K-R meaning small. Now chemists actually use the microscopic view to help explain what gets observed at the macroscopic level. For example, if you take this picture here, what you see is a person in a suit. And that suit allows them to jump up and hit the wall and stick to it. Now what material do you think is shown in that photograph? We see another picture down in this lower corner that is a picture at a different viewpoint. Would you believe that this is a macroscopic or a microscopic view of that material? If you said microscopic, then you're right. In 1948, George de Mestrel took a close look at the burrs, cockle burrs, that stuck to his clothing. You see a picture of that over here to the right. We see that each burr was covered with many tiny hooks. In 1955, de Mestrel patented the design for the hook and loop tapes, which we now call Velcro, that are now used widely as fasteners. Now what does the microscopic view show that wouldn't be visible in a macroscopic view? Hopefully you notice that you can actually see the hook and it actually hooking through the loops from the other type of fabric. What do chemists actually do in our world? They might design materials to fit very specific needs, just like Velcro fits a need in society. Energy consumption is a concern for our entire society, and chemists play an essential role in finding ways to conserve, produce, and even store energy. Chemists also supply the medicines, materials, and technology that doctors use to treat patients. Chemists help to develop more productive crops and safer, more effective ways to protect our crops. They help to identify pollutants and prevent pollution to protect us from our environment. And they study our universe by gathering data from afar and analyzing matter that is brought back to Earth from space. So we've talked about a lot of the things that chemists do in a very broad way. Now we're going to look specifically within some of these different areas to see some specific examples of how they do each of these things. First, we're going to consider energy conservation. Now, energy can be conserved through the use of insulation, which acts as a barrier to heat flow into or out of an environment. Trapped air is a great barrier to the movement of thermal energy. Fiberglass has air trapped by a network of thin fibers that are woven together. Foam insulation is a little different. It has air pockets that are completely enveloped by the solid that makes up the framework of the foam. Sea gel is actually a particular type of insulation that's light enough to float on soap bubbles. So here we see a solid floating on soap bubbles. Is that possible? It's made up of agar, a derivative of seaweed. A gelatin-like mixture of agar and water is freeze-dried in order to remove the water. Now this leaves behind a honeycomb of dried agar filled with air. Sea gel actually has a density approximately equal to that of air, and it is biodegradable also. You can actually view a video of this after you finish this presentation. Fossil fuels, the burning of coal, petroleum, and natural gas are a major source of energy. However, fossil fuel supplies are limited, and scientists are working to develop alternative energy sources. Chemists help in this endeavor 
because they help to develop biodiesel from a soybean oil to provide a renewable alternative fuel source. In terms of storing energy, many applications require that energy be able to be stored until required. Batteries use chemicals to store energy that can later be released as an electric current. Some batteries are actually rechargeable, like those in your cell phones and laptops. Okay, so that's a few of the ways that chemists can actually help in terms of energy usage, storage, production, etc. Now we're going to look at how chemists actually help doctors to help you. About 40% of all modern medicines come from chemicals produced by plants or animals. Chemists first identify the effective ingredient, which is frequently referred to as the active ingredient. They purify it then they show that it is safe for human use. Sometimes they must modify the chemical to make it more effective or to make it less toxic. Now people used ingredients from plants as folk remedies for centuries before chemists were able to isolate the actual active ingredients from these extracts. Morphine was the first active ingredient that was isolated and it was isolated in 1804. Salicylates occur naturally in plants such as willow, poplar, and beech trees. Salicin was isolated from willow bark in 1828 by Johann Buckner and was later used to produce salicylic acid that you can see pictured over here. Chemists developed acetyl salicylic acid, also known as aspirin, which is similar to salicylic acid in its beneficial properties, but due to its slightly different chemical construction, actually causes less irritation. Recently, scientists have actually turned their attention to animal venom as a source of drugs. The venom can contain numerous fast-acting toxins that target muscles and nerves. Why do you think the death stalker scorpion produces venom? Think about this for a second. I would probably say that it has the venom so that it can paralyze its prey. Now scientists have found that its toxin can block the chloride channels in glioma cancer cells, keeping the cells from shrinking and migrating to other locations in the brain. So that's an application that chemists have come up with for this venom. Why do you think that a poison dart frog produces venom? Do you think it uses it to stun its prey? I don't think it's a predator. What I would say is that it uses it in defense against predators. Nearly 600 alkaloid toxins have been isolated from glands in the skin of these frogs. The frogs collect the toxins throughout their life from ants, mites, millipedes, and other arthropods. Chemists can help develop and test materials to perform functions within the human body. Artificial hips and knees have been created to replace worn out joints so that people can walk again without pain. And as you see here, artificial hearts have been created. This specific one was created using titanium as shown in the picture. Scientists worldwide worked on the Human Genome Project from 1990 to 2003. They identified about 30,000 genes that comprise human DNA. The discovery of the structure of DNA led to the development of biotechnology. Another goal of the Human Genome Project was to develop analytical tools that could be transferred to the private sector and address any ethical, legal, and social implications that arose due to this project. If the gene that causes jellyfish to glow is inserted into a potato plant, it can actually be used to tell whether the plant needs water. So biotechnology can be used to develop plants that can survive a drought. A dehydrated altered potato plant glows under black light as seen here. If water must be conserved, this can be used to determine when the plants actually need water. Less overwatering means that less nutrients will be leached from the soil as well. Chemistry is also used in agriculture in crop protection. Chemists sometimes use chemicals produced by insects to fight insect pests. You see a plastic tube in this image. 
that's wrapped around the stem of the tomato plant. And it actually contains a chemical that a female pinworm moth emits to attract male moths. It acts to interfere with the mating process so that fewer pinworms are produced. In terms of the environment, chemists are very active. Pollutants are materials found in air, water, or soil that are harmful to humans or other organisms. Chemists identify pollutants. As an example, lead used to be a common additive in paints and gasoline. However, in 1971 it was found that lead is harmful to humans in much smaller doses than previously thought, especially in the case of children. Even low levels of lead in the blood can permanently damage the nervous system of a growing child. Chemists are also involved in pollution prevention. The strategies used to prevent lead poisoning include testing children's blood for lead, regulation of home sales to families with young children, and public awareness campaigns with posters. If we look at this graph, of children in the US with elevated blood lead levels. Let's see if we can figure out a couple of these questions. What percentage of children had elevated lead levels in the late 1970s? Looks to me like it was about 88.2 percent. If you look you can see that from 1976 to 1980 you see that very large bar that goes up to 88.2. How could we explain the dramatic drop in the percentage of children affected by lead poisoning between 1980 and 1988? It drops from 88.2 in the late 70s clear down to 2.2 by 2000. Lead was banned in gasoline and in public water supply systems, so less lead entered the environment, resulting in a much lower level of lead in children. Why do you think the reduction in lead levels slowed down since the first dramatic drop between 1980 and 1988? Well, this graph doesn't actually tell us that, but what actually happened is that the major remaining source of lead is the existing paint in old houses. This source is difficult to remove. The first drop was due to composition control of new products and changes in treatment plans for water supplies. However, removal of paint from old houses is a much longer drawn out and expensive process. Switching gears here, let's look at phytoremediation. Using biological organisms to change levels of toxic chemicals in the environment. Phytoremediation actually involves the use of plants to remove pollutants from soil or water. Unfortunately, it's confined to just the area covered by the depths of the roots, so it can't remove those things that are lower in depth than the roots actually reach. A plant can absorb lead through its roots, and that lead can accumulate in the leaves and in the stems of the plant. So, after harvesting, those plants can be burned and the lead residue buried in an approved landfill, or they may choose to recover it. Our last topic is how chemists help us to study the universe. With help from NASA, chemists study matter from other bodies in the solar system. Apollo astronauts brought rocks from the moon which chemists have analyzed. Their tests show that some of these rocks are similar to volcanic rocks formed right here on Earth. This suggests that the moon's surface was once covered by large areas of molten lava, which are known as maria. Maria meaning seas because as you see in this image of the moon, you see large black areas that almost look like oceans. And that's how they got their name. Scientists can also study the composition of stars just by looking at the light that those stars emit. Now you'll learn in chapter 4 how the light emitted from a star can tell you what elements are present in that star. But we're not there yet. Thank you for listening and I will join you again in section 3.